um, Port Outreach Committee meeting. And uh, so that is, that's that's a pretty big feat in itself. And so we appreciate all of you for, for being along that whole time. Um, Julia, do you wanna do a uh, roll call? Yes, thank you. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the meeting. So I'd like to remind everyone this meeting is being recorded. Uh, we ask that you please rename your Zoom name to your full name and the organization that you're with, if possible. And if you're a resident, please put the letter R. So for roll call, I'm just going to go down the list as it appears on my screen. And when I call on your name, if you could please just unmute and say which organization you're with. And at the end, I'll be introducing those that are from the Port of Stockton that are on the call. Okay, so first up, we have Chuck. Good afternoon, all. Chuck DeYoung with H.J. Baker. Thank you. Welcome, Chuck. And then we have Jared. Yes, good afternoon. Jared Kubshock, Nevada Cement Company. Thank you. Welcome. And SB. Hello, good afternoon. Um, Esperanza Vilma with Environmental Justice Coalition for Water. Welcome. And then Kyle. Oh, hey there, everybody. It's Kyle from CAR. Hi, Kyle. Thank you. And then we have Mary Elizabeth. Uh, Mary Elizabeth, get in my record book. Hi, Mary Elizabeth. Thank you. Welcome. And then we have Rachel. Hi, everyone. Rachel from CARB. Welcome. Hi, Rachel. And then Raul. Hello, everybody. Raul Hernandez. I'm with the San Joaquin Building Trades Council. Thanks, Raul. Welcome. And then we have Stephen. Hi, Stephen Bender with Compliance First. Thank you, Stephen. And then Tanisha. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tanisha with Catholic Charities. Thank you. And then from the Port of Stockton, which we've got quite a few, we have Commission Chair uh, William Treza, Commissioner David Atwater, Port Director Kirk De Jesus, Jeff Wingfield, Deputy Port Director of Regulatory and Public Affairs. Then we have Katie Miller, Deputy Port Director of Administration. And we have Jason Cashman, Director of Environmental Affairs, Daniel Orozco, Grants Management Specialist, Victoria Lucero, our Public Relations Coordinator, and Karen Romero and myself. And if I missed anybody, I apologize. With that, I'll turn it back on over to you, Jeff. Great, thank you, appreciate it. Um, really briefly, we've got uh, just, just a few um, port updates. Um, we did, as we were talking about earlier, we had our, uh, we got a little bit of a jump start on coastal cleanup day, which is, uh, I believe it's this upcoming Saturday, is that correct? For most people, okay. Uh, so we we went out last last Saturday, um, and uh, we had a, a pretty good group. We were actually expecting a, a much smaller turnout. Um, I think we only had fifteen folks that were that were registered, but then um, we had uh, close to forty folks that came out, which was a really good turnout. Um, a great representation from the the tenants, uh, the community. Um, SB always shows up in mass and uh, she's great. And uh, we had uh, Port Commissioner um, Michael Duffy attend. And for those who have attended in the past, we, we did something a little bit different this time. We weren't out at the usual spots because a lot of the usual spots are no longer receiving um, dumping, which is, which is great. Uh, but there was some uh, area in, um, in Boggs Tract that uh, really needed some some cleanup and it was uh, actually some port owned property out there. And uh, that went really well. We had, uh, we picked up about 8,000 pounds of, of trash. Um, 
again, uh, great support, a lot of hard work. We had uh, Environmental Justice Coalition for Water, obviously with SB. We had one member from Sierra Club, uh, one of our stevedores and the port's main stevedore, SSA Marine was out there, Cafe Coop, Central Valley Gender Health and Wellness Center, Delta Sigma Pi of the University of Pacific. They brought out a, a number of folks, which was great. They, they needed to get some community um, hours in. And so, uh, as well as uh, one of our one of our employees, uh, their, their daughter needed to get some community hours as well. So that was great. Um, the Dream Foundation, Active Change, Local 456, uh, number of port staff, and then Green Bay Landscaping as well. So I think it was a good day. It was a little bit warm, but um, we got a lot of work done in a short period of time. Uh, it was interesting to see a lot of the folks that were driving by from the Boggs Track community, um, really taking a look to see what we were doing. And uh, I think it inspired them maybe to, to do a little bit more, um, you know, clean up around, around the neighborhood as well. So uh, that, was, that went really well. Anybody who was there that wanted to say anything else about uh, Coastal Cleanup Day? Okay. Um, one thing that that hit us uh, when we were out there, though, it, it, there there is uh, a few port properties out there that that may lend themselves to um, some uh, community greening in in the upcoming um, years, and so that was one of the things that SB and I talked about. So we're going to continue to talk and see if we can look at grant opportunities for um, maybe some kind of little. Uh, pocket parks or or just in additional tree plantings that that can happen out in some of those locations so that would be a great opportunity so um and i think little manila is also doing some um vegetation in the bog tract uh area so i want to reach out to them too and see if there's any synergies there we can we can tap into um one of the things we've been working on very hard is uh, we we talked about at the last POC meeting is the reconnecting communities grant um that is uh it's a study grant to look at opportunities to reroute trucks and, and get them out of the box tract uh neighborhood um really to eliminate Fresno if at all possible from uh any any port trucks um and so I've asked Daniel he's our uh grants coordinator to talk about um, kind of where we are with, with that grant application. So Daniel. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Yes, hi everyone. Um, as Jeff mentioned, uh, we talked about this uh, grant opportunity last month. Um, so we are looking to hopefully reroute some of the traffic coming into box track and outside um, from the surrounding communities. Um, so, Jeff, just to add on for the community projects, we did earmark some funds within the grant. So um, if we do get awarded, we have some opportunity to help, you know, fund some beautification or tree planting within the box track community. So that should be good. Um, we are looking for letters of support. It would be really helpful for EJ groups as this specific grant is really emphasizing community engagement and we love the support the community gives and we would like to have a letter of support um, we did send out an email uh last week but i can send out a reminder if necessary yeah that would be that would be great and this 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 grant is really going to be um if we get this the study funding it will really be engaging with um the bogs track community and and other uh, ej groups to really figure out and work together to figure out the best route for um Port traffic. So, any questions or or thoughts on on uh, this grant opportunity? Yes. Yes. Um, I just think that it would be really important to engage the local residents, and I know that I don't. I don't know. I don't know uh, when or if the uh, box track community center advisory group is meeting or meets at all but you know i think that that would be uh definitely uh some folks to get involved also there's a, a 
at least one church there on Washington, you know, mm -hmm. and so it would be a good idea to reach out to the faith community and, um, you know, if it, if it does involve any county lands, you know, at least, you know, letting someone know the county and, you know, also probably uh, someone at the city. Yes, yes, uh, totally agree. That's a great idea about, uh, you know, the church. Um, I don't know if the, does anyone else have any other information on the Box Track Community Advisory Committee? Because I've, I, uh, we've talked to Frank over at the community center, and I'm assuming that's where they, they would meet. Um, but I have not heard anything mentioned about that, but we will look into that and see if that's, if that's an opportunity for us, because we definitely want to have the community members uh, in that area involved in that study. That's for sure. Will you, so listen, since, go ahead. Will, you will you solicit the school, Jeff? Yes. Yes. We, we, we have, uh, and we will talk to the school and we'll probably be uh, putting some information out uh, about the, the, the study um, once we get the grant through the school as well. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll try to cover as many, um, gathering areas over in, in box tract as possible. And I think that there's a, I know I'm jumping in here. I apologize. As no, there's, um, there's the, um, the board of supervisor there. Uh, you know, he, the, it's a County run advisory community board. So, uh, I would I recommend reaching out to him and you also want to, I uh, don't limit just to the school. You want to make sure that the uh, superintendent's office and the they have a safe routes to school, you know, group, right? You know, or someone that's involved with that. And then, yeah, thank you. I'll be quiet now. Okay. No, you're fine. No, those are all very helpful, uh, helpful points. So, um, yeah, reaching out to... I believe Miguel Villapadua is still the county supervisor there. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we we will we will reach out to them as well. We have been coordinating with with the county um, and the city just on our idea of of how to make this work. But uh, yes, we will not leave them out as we as we continue to move forward. Um, speaking of the school. Uh, my next update is, uh, you know, Washington Elementary did just get a new principal. Oh, Jeff, um, um, and yeah. SB's hand is that. SB, do you have a question? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I just had a question regarding the grant. I don't know if maybe I missed this, but are we, um, is this study being done in conjunction with any of like the universities? Because I know for a fact that there is a couple of, um, professors and PhD candidates at UC Davis that have been studying different components of um, trucks. So um, if we don't have anyone on board yet, I'd be like, you know, more than happy to reach out to the Environmental Health Science Center. Okay, Daniel, you want to respond to that? Right now, we are working with HDR using prior uh, studies that we've done in the area. I don't think we have anything in there right now for additional uh, support. Um, we would have to discuss with HDR and how that would look like, Jeff. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's it's not a bad idea, though. Go ahead. Okay. Well, what I could do still, if you'd like, Jeff and Daniel, is connect you all with them because they might be already doing like another study in another area that's similar. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't necessarily be coming out of your grant, but they might have something else. Plus they have these like little mini grants that we can um, apply for that's within the UC system. Okay. That would be great. Yeah. The, the sooner we can talk to them, the better, because if there is okay. anything we need to put in the, in the application, we'll want to get that in soon. I think Daniel, when, when is that uh, submittal date? It's going to be next week. Next week. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, okay. SB, we'll, we'll, if you send that over, we'll, we'll connect really quickly and, and uh, yeah. see if they're there's quick, anything. Yeah, they're quick to respond. So I'll put you in contact with them. Um, I'll send an email out. Very good. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, just speaking, this is off the top of my head, uh, but uh, one of the other things we've been talking about doing, is, and it's been going on for a while, we haven't got a lot of traction really with the 
city or county, but is to see whether or not, you know, we go to a lot of other communities where they've got, uh, you know, their utility boxes are, um, are painted, decorated. Um, so we just, in the back of my mind, uh, we've been thinking about, wouldn't that be great if we could generate a little bit of port pride by having, you know, port scenes or something like that um, on some of the utility boxes near the port and box track and things like that. So we are reaching out to um, UOP and Delta College to see if there are any interested students that would be uh, wanting to engage in a project to, to kind of beautify the, the, the neighborhood as well. And I don't know if anybody has any connections or thoughts or has tried that before in other areas of the, of the city, um, but that's just something we're, we're considering. Yeah, Jeff, I actually, we, we, we did, I was we, on the, go ahead. oh, when I was on the phone with yeah. SB um, earlier, she was going to connect us with somebody at Delta. And then I'm sorry if I cut uh, somebody else off just now. That's okay. So, so we, we did another project, kind of a local beautification thing. We donated a bunch of clean open top drums that students at the local school painted up with various themes, they movie themes and different uh, peanuts, whatever, and they painted the, the cans. And they became permanent trash cans around neighborhoods and parks and things. And we, we produced, I don't know, several hundred of those uh, uh, around places. And that, that was kind of a beautification thing and pride thing where the kids could uh, participate in the school. Yeah. So we have done that before. So um, that was kind of cool. Yeah, that's great. Okay. We'll pick your mind a little bit more about, about that. Um, so, uh, Anything else on any of those topics? I can't see hands. Okay. So oh, the, yeah, my hands up again. Sorry. Okay. So um, with regards to that, what I was going to do is that there are a couple of the um, professors at Delta College that do the Indigenous Peoples Day. And so they have art as a component of it. So one of our members works with them. And so I was going to reach out to them and then see how, you know, maybe they can include that and have like, if there's like a historical component or EJ or anything that we can like include, that would be great. And so I'm going to put them in contact with you all um, as a follow up. Oh, perfect. Perfect. All right. Uh, having the schools would be great. Yes, I, I agree. I think that would be a great project. They've done some really cool uh, murals over at, at Washington Elementary, and it just kind of got us thinking that the more stuff we could do like that around town, I think is just uh, it just brings a little bit more sense of pride to to the community. Um, I would just uh, so um, speaking of the school, we 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 did have turnover. They they uh, their principal left after last year. We were trying to wait to see who they were going to put in place. And uh, we went over and met uh, with the principal last week and um, she embraced us with open arms and was really excited to, to partner with us and to continue the efforts that we've that we've begun with them, um, whether it's, you know, being active in the classrooms and and doing kind of the out presentations and, and, and sharing about the port um, and, and continuing with uh, some of the, the bringing the tenants on board and and. and the kind of working with the, the teachers on the wish lists. Um, and so she, uh, she was very welcoming. And um, so with that, we, we've started up uh, the back to school clothing drive for, for Washington Elementary. Um, that's been really successful last year. We've got a good jump start on it this year. We invite our, our tenants, um, but also other community. If you guys know other folks who are, you know, just cleaning out the closet or whatever, um, there, there's a big need in that neighborhood for, for, for clothes and, and, you know, it's heartbreaking to see some of the, the, the younger ones that, you know, as the weather starts to turn from, from summer to, to fall and gets cooler to see them in there with, um, you know, not, not having any shoes. And, uh, and so we really want to provide the school with every opportunity, um, you know, the, their principal there wants to make the school a safe place. They wants the, the to put, um, you know, the kids to leave all the outside world behind, to be at school, to be comfortable. 
Uh, and so we're going to do everything we can to, to help provide that and to provide other additional resources for, um, for the students over there. I was surprised that, that the, the annual budget for this, for the school, um, for any other additional services was like $90,000 and Mary Elizabeth, I don't know uh, what to compare that to as far as, um, other schools, but uh, it seemed like it was a pretty limited budget, uh, to me. And, um, so we're going to do everything we can. We're going to generate as much activity as we can with the tenants and uh, to provide what Washington uh, elementary needs. Many other hands? No. Okay. Um, so uh, I think last, uh, last uh, meeting, we did talk a little bit about the bonnet capture and control system. Um, that the port is is working towards. Uh, I just wanted to bring it back here today, just just to kind of keep it on everybody's the front of everybody's mind. Um, that uh, we do have four million dollars uh, currently. We're trying to work with the air district now to get additional funding. We think the cost is going to be somewhere between ten and twelve million for this device. Um, but it's going to it is a transformative thing for the port and for the for the community. Really, one of the the best ways that we can reduce emissions. Um, and so those efforts are continuing and just wanted to make sure that uh, if you weren't here last week or last month that you at least uh, saw that this is something ongoing. It's kind of over in our maritime department. You know, these bonnets, they, they, they can reduce emissions from ships for, you know, up to 98%. Um, I think CARB maybe gives them a little bit uh, less than the, less, uh, less percentage than that. Um, but we are excited uh, to, to get something in play here, here at the Port of Stockton. And there's a rendering of kind of what it would look like. Um, so it, it would be a, a barge that sits either adjacent to or forward or aft of, of the vessel. Uh, a bonnet goes over the stack. Um, all the emissions go through the, the tubing down into a scrubber. It's a uh, fairly old technology, but it, it works. The, the scrubbers can remove, um, you know, high percentages of uh, NOx and, and uh, PM10 and PM2.5. Marco, looks like you have a, your hand up. Yeah, um, Jeff, um, I wonder if you could take your arrow or, or your pointer or something and kind of show where the bonnet actually is. I can't, I still can't visualize it. Oh, sure, sure, sure. So that it, that's the is top right of the here? crane. So it goes, go down, keep going down. The right there is where, go up a little bit. Oh, right that there, black. right there. Ah. That's that's where the stack is. And that's where the, the bonnet would would sit over the stack uh, to be able to capture the emissions from, from tanker vessels. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, the interpreter has her hand up. Hi, Karita and Jerry. I think it's probably okay to, to hop off now. I don't okay. think Douglas is gonna join. All right, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Good night. Yeah, we Good appreciate night. it. Thanks, you uh, Anything from CARB on the, um, the bonnet system that anybody wanted to mention? It's kind of an update for for port tenants as well, this is kind of what we're looking for to be able to um, capture emissions from tanker vessels as, as they're coming into the port. But more to come on that as uh, our, our uh, discussions with the manufacturers um, evolve. Nothing for me. Thank you for the update and good luck getting more funding. Thank you. We appreciate that. Um, and then the only other thing I have today is, uh, so I, we, we were talking about a little bit earlier, is, is on Monday, we're hosting our first annual Port of Stockton golf tournament uh, to benefit Boggs Track. And so um, a lot of that money is going to go towards uh, the um, community center. A lot of the after school programs have been cut. We'd like to help them revitalize those programs there very needed by uh, a lot of the families in the in the Boggs Tract area. Uh, and so we try to get those programs back um, back in operational. 
Uh, we're also going to be having some of that funding set aside to uh, help and be able to address teacher wish, wish lists um, and any other um, needs that the, the Washington Elementary School might have. So we, we sold it out. We're really excited about it. Um, it's our first time we thought we were going to have a little bit more fun planning a golf tournament, but and it's been a lot of work, but uh, it'll be it'll be exciting to be able to really provide uh, that needed funding to to Boggs Tract. And let me check my notes. I think that is all. If there are any um, of the groups that want to meet, we are meeting um, semi-regularly with, with uh, so Sierra Club or as needed, as, as requested. Uh, we do have a monthly meeting now with Restore the Delta. Um, I'm happy to, to meet with uh, any of the other groups that, that want to hold routine meetings. Um, our door is open, so please, please do reach out. And then the only other thing was uh, Julia wanted to give an update on the jobs board. Yes, yes. So um, just a reminder for the tenants that are on the call, I think a couple that are are signed up for our tenant jobs board. But uh, just a reminder that we're here to help if you needed help posting your open positions or had any questions. And then also if you talk to other tenants, you know, maybe you can mention that, hey, I'm signed up or maybe uh, help us get some feedback. And then also in the coming weeks, we are going to be mailing out a brochure to tenants um, just to encourage folks to sign up. And then a reminder that if you do hire someone that lives near the port within the AB 617 boundary that you get $8,000 rent credit. So yeah. And then also for community members that are on the call, we also encourage you to have your friends, family sign up. And then it's still in the beginning stages, but um, we're, we're really getting the ball rolling with it still. So thank you. Oh, and then Mary Elizabeth. Yeah, I just, I, it's a great thing, you know, and it's, uh, it's really good. I wish that, you know, everyone can uh, know about that. And how many, how many, do you have like a click or a check, you know, way to monitor how many people check it, you know, or, you know, to track that kind of metrics? Yes, we do have something in place to track it. And then we also keep a keep tabs on the number of people that are signed up. Um, we don't have as many signed up as we'd like, but um, we're hopeful that we will get there. Yeah, I think the last time I checked it, there was between four and six jobs on there, if I remember correctly. Maybe that's a little high. Um, and we've had some people that have tried uh, and they did. Um, They've made hires that they thought were gonna that were going to um, count, but but they didn't. So we really want to, people to take advantage of this, and so it's gonna need you know that's something else. I think um, Mary Elizabeth, as we go around and we talk about the opportunity for the truck rerouting, that we can also really promote the jobs board and get uh, get folks signed up. Um, but anytime we hear about a job, any port jobs are on there. Um, and anytime we hear about any tenant jobs, we're pushing that out um, as much as we can. There's WorkNet and, you know, some of the other community uh, groups that, you know, are helping with folks getting hired and uh, Delta you know, would be good to, to, you know, reach out there to their uh, career development folks and uh, UOP too, you know, uh, go Tigers. <laughs> yeah, I know we've talked to WorkNet. Um, I can't remember where, where that ended up, but, uh, but yes, we will, we'll reach out to, to Delta and uh, we'll provide an update kind of a status report next next month. Um, I wanted to thank everybody who did provide feedback on our, um, our poll about when we should hold this meeting and how often. Uh, it looks like um, four o'clock works for the majority of people. Um, not too many people wanted to take us up on the noon um, with lunch, but, uh, so four o'clock at hybrid, I think, uh, is, is where we'll, 
we'll keep this. And it looked like for the most part, everybody wanted to maintain this at uh, the monthly level. So we'll continue that. Um, hopefully our next meeting will be hybrid and uh, we can have some folks in person and, and uh, kind of carry, carry on that way. Um, usually a lot of these meetings are about kind of air quality uh, related goals. Um, today, we wanted to give you uh, a little bit more information about something that people may not know that, that we do on a regular basis, uh, pretty much 24 uh, seven basis. Um, and that is that we operate a dissolved oxygen aeration facility on the port. And back in, uh, I think it was 1998, um, the San Joaquin River was uh, designated um, as a uh, non-compliance for dissolved oxygen. And so it was actually acting as a, as a barrier for fish migration in the area. And so the regional board, it was added to the section 303D list uh, of the Clean Water Act. They developed a TMDL. And then um, studies began about what's causing the, the impairment. And just as a really quick uh, background, the impairment really was caused by uh, three different um, aspects. And that is uh, the channel geometry, um, the um, Oxygen, oxygen demanding substances that were being pumped into the river from users upstream and water diversions. So through that, you know, you slow water down a lot when it comes from the San Joaquin into the ship channel. And so um, it was leading to low dissolved oxygen levels in, in the ship channel. Um, let's see. So I think, yeah, there I covered it all there. We can go to the next slide. So um, there's been a lot of a lot of attempts to try to fix this. Um, we have been working on different studies with uh, in partnership with UOP and in partnership with Department of Water Resources for the last 20 years, trying to figure out okay how do we how do we fix this problem? Um, why is the port involved? We'll take a step back real quick. So because of the, the channel geometry, that, that section of it was pushed over to the Corps of Engineers. Um, the port took over uh, for the Corps um, because almost anything that was going to be coming out of uh, the Corps budget for dealing with the dissolved oxy oxygen and the ship channel was gonna come out of our, our dredging budget. And so the port decided it was easier since we're the landowner right here to take, take over this responsibility and act on the Corps' behalf. Um, and so we have kind of taken ownership of almost the entire program. Um, there are, when we talk about water diverters, so a lot of the water diverters are a part of our, our group, uh, our consortium that operate the aerator, uh, that pay into it. Um, others, uh, farming uh, entities, uh, upstream are also are also involved, and so the they just provide us funding, and the port takes ownership of all the maintenance, operation, uh, the reporting, um, everything to do with that. So um, the so since the uh, the basin plan amendment in two thousand five. There were uh, some improvements made to the city's wastewater facility that tremendously uh, improved dissolved oxygen. Um, and during that same time, the Department of Water Resources was constructing this demonstration uh, aeration facility right here at Dock 20 uh, at the port. Next slide. So you can see the location, uh, it's, it's kind of, it was strategically located right there because that's right in the middle of the dissolved oxygen sag. Uh, there were dye studies to look at how far upstream and downstream this facility could potentially impact waters. Um, and it was determined it was about a mile upstream and a mile downstream from the aeration facility. Uh, there were much, there were, we tried this on a much smaller scale for, for years before building this, this larger facility. Uh, and it, the, the dissolved oxygen um, projects that we did really had a good impact on, on 
dissolved oxygen in the ship channel. So then uh, in 2012, we ended, we uh, worked on an agreement, a funding agreement, an operational agreement with, with the various agencies that we're working on, working with, um, and it's been in place ever since. And the reason I'm bringing it today is because we just recently renegotiated the, the agreement and um, everybody signed back on to, to be able to operate it. Next slide. So it, it's a pretty simple uh, device. It, uh, there's a YouTube, there's an oxygen storage tank, a YouTube that goes down around 250 feet into the water, into the ground that pressurizes the, the oxygen into the water. It's then distributed uh, along the bottom of the ship channel. Um, and it was designed to handle about 10,000 pounds of oxygen per day. And, and that was the, the, the load that um, the Regional Water Board came to the conclusion that, that we were missing. I already talked about the location, so we can go to the next slide. And this is kind of a, a visual uh, from, from looking at it from above. Steve, do you want to uh, kind of go through this real quick? So Steve Bender is uh, one of our consultants. Uh, he helps to operate and maintain uh, the aerator. So Steve, if you could give us a little run through here. Sure. So up at the top right there, you can see where the pumps are located, where we bring the water in. And then uh, on the left, where it says liquid oxygen tank, we have about 6,000 gallons of liquid oxygen that we then vaporize. It goes through all the control systems where we can regulate the amount of uh, oxygen that we want to inject into the into the water. And then it gets injected into the water. It goes down 200 feet or so. And mm -hmm. uh, the, the weight of the water column kind of entrains that oxygen in the water. And then it gets discharged along dock 19 back into the channel. Yeah, so essentially it's just like a fish bubbler for your, your home uh, fish tank, but made on a, a scale much, much bigger, obviously. So we don't really show where the where the uh, at least on this slide where the uh, discharge is, but we can we'll show that in just a second. Let's go to the next slide. So um, monitoring is done at three different locations uh, or three different depths. So to go back real quick, we can show you. Um, Go to the, the previous slide. There's a water quality monitoring station that is right adjacent to the um, the uh, aeration device. You can see it's called RRI monitoring station. That's Rough and Ready Island. That is one of the uh, California Data Exchange um, monitoring locations for surrounds the entire delta, and uh, um, there's there's hundreds of them. Uh, through, throughout the Delta and uh, pro and I think in other locations as well. But that's where we monitor um, monitor that it takes 15 minute increment um, dissolved oxygen readings and and we're watching that 24 seven to be able to determine when we need to operate this this device. You can go to the next slide again. So what we're really trying to do is keep uh, dissolved oxygen levels above 5.2 milligrams per liter um, or 6.0 milligrams per liter, depending on, on the time of year. But that's really what fish need to, to be able to, to migrate and uh, to support healthy aquatic uh, ecosystems there. Um, Steve, is there anything you want to touch on this one? Uh, no, basically, like Jeff was saying, we monitor Pretty much uh, a couple times a day, we look at that live data that's on CDEC, the, the data exchange, uh, to determine how much oxygen we need to put in, uh, whether we need to run both pumps. Uh, and then every day, we make sure the system's running uh, properly and do any repairs as needed. Next slide. So this is kind of what the data looks like when 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 we visualize it. Um, so we're watching for trends and things like that. If you know the 
you can go to the next slide, but it talks about, uh, you know, if we're getting close to the objective uh, and then we know we've got some hot, hot weather coming, um, there's a lot of things, or there's uh, additional water releases that we know are coming from upstream sources. We can kind of figure out exactly um, when uh, we need to turn on or turn off the, the aeration device. But go ahead with this, Steve. Oh, so yeah, as it says here, we will burn through probably 4,000 4, gallons of oxygen every five days while it's operating at full capacity, which we don't really operate at full capacity that often, but um, that's kind of the worst case scenario, I guess you might call it. But um, yeah, we don't necessarily operate if you just have a few data points below the objective, it kind of has to, you want to watch the trends as it, as it kind of goes up and down to, to be as efficient as possible with this. All right, you want to go to the next slide? So you can see there on the uh, in the picture, that's just one of the like it's a flow meter. It kind of gives you an idea of how much water you're, you're we're capable of moving. So that's one pump uh, right there. It says that we're moving 21.8 cubic feet of water per second at the speed of 7.86 feet per second. So we're moving rather large quantities of water through this thing. And uh, it says there on one of the one of the bullet points, uh, electricity being a fairly high cost, which is why, uh, because we're moving so much water. And all in all, we're, uh, the, the total uh, funding available to us per year is, is about $100,000. And so we've really tried to make it as cost effective as possible. We can go back and ask for more. Um, thankfully we haven't had to yet, but we're, we're kind of at a point where, you know, this system being, uh, what is it? 16 years old now, I think Steve, that yep. we're starting to see some failures and we've had to reduce, do a lot of maintenance and, and replacement of, of parts. And, um, so, but we've been able to keep it operational when it needs to be, which is, which has been tremendous. Um, but, uh, but that's kind of what our, what our general, um, uh, funding levels are just from the last couple of years we've had to we've had to paint it we've had to replace uh like the bottom section of the pump so like the impellers the shafts the bowl section uh we've had to replace a few other miscellaneous little parts but some fairly fairly major parts uh just because of age Mm -hmm. Yes, and and as we put in the in the chat, would would be able to offset some of the electricity use with solar, and that is uh, that's 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 a possibility. Um, we're trying to identify uh, some good locations for additional solar. You know, I think as I mentioned in previous um, meetings, we have uh, submitted for I think it's Daniel was it six megawatts of solar, and and then uh, battery backup uh, as well for the yeah. plane port? Yeah, yeah, I think it was a combined uh, six megawatts with the batteries being back up. Yeah, so yes, potentially could be, we could offset some of the costs with, with solar SP. And then uh, daily inputs range from 500 pounds to 7,000 pounds, depending on conditions, Steve, and anything else on this one? No, it's really dependent upon like upstream flows how much how much water is flowing into the the water body and then the temperature of those flows so colder water holds oxygen better so as temperatures heat up that's where we usually end up having to run and the algae blooms have had a uh, somewhat of an impact on on dissolved oxygen as well for sure all right next slide Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, so it's talking about uh, maintenance and repairs again. We do try to 
obviously we try to maintain this thing as best as we can uh, during the off season. Unfortunately, uh, not everything breaks during the off season, but uh, we, we definitely try to keep it operational uh, during the time it does need to run. So compressor rebuilds, painting, um, we may have to replace a motor at some point here soon. So those are all things we're trying to plan on in order to keep it up and running. And uh, I, I attended a regional water quality control board meeting a, a few years ago, and they, they claimed that this uh, this TMDL was one of the most successful TMDLs in the state. And I can't remember the full numbers of, of the days of noncompliance uh, before. I want to think it was around 150 to 200 days of noncompliance before we started this. And I believe now, or at least at the time, it was less than seven days of noncompliance, which was... Uh, which was tremendous. And then annual reporting. Um, we provide an annual report to the, the other stakeholders um, as well as to the Regional Water Quality Control Board on an annual basis. Those uh, reports are on our website under the water quality page. Um, so if anybody's interested to, to see more, uh, they, can visit, they can visit there as well. Next slide. Before you go on, um, oh, sure. just, here's Margo. Um, so uh, you mentioned the algal blooms. Does this help control it? The Any aerator? Time? Yeah. You know, that was my hope at one point, Margo. And uh, I did try to use it when we had very high algal blooms um, just to see if it would make an impact because you would think it would be mixing the water column. Um, yeah. where, where the algae really really likes to take advantage of the, the striated uh, uh, water bodies and the, the different temperatures there. This didn't seem to have a big effect um, or operating the, the aerator because I was really hoping it would. But a lot of the things that we don't have really high concentrations of, of the algal blooms down in this location. Um, yeah. So it may be a little bit more effective down in, say, McLeod Lake. Um, I know there the city has, they, they tried to adopt something a little similar to ours, but on a much smaller scale down there to try to, to mix up the water column. But uh, I don't think it's been as effective as, and it's probably not on the size of scale that, that they need. Um, so I don't know if you were here the last meeting, but we talked about uh, potentially uh, dredging as an option to remove some of the seed bed. And uh, that was another grant application that we submitted uh, in cooperation with um, uh, one of our consultants and, and uh, DWR to see if that was uh, uh, a viable option to remove some of the the algal bloom seeds. Huh, interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Why wasn't that? Wasn't the city just pumping air into the into the upper channel there at the top of the you know McLeod Lake in that area? It was just pumping air in there for yes. air bubbler aeration rather than adding oxygen. Yes, to the water. Were. Yes. They were, it was, yeah, and it was such a small scale. Um, our, one of our early, uh, our early models of the, the aeration facility also did that. It, we just pumped uh, atmospheric air and the, just the transfer of oxygen uh, was not as efficient as, as a system like this, where you're taking in pure oxygen, um, which is why we went away from that model. It used to be out at dock 12 and 13. Um, and we operated that for the core and, and uh, for, for quite a while. Um, but this, this is the efficiency of the system is just so much better. And uh, so here's our annual days of operation. So it really depends. It is really weather dependent. When we see um, uh, really wet winters, we typically see a lot less uh, of the dissolved oxygen sag. Uh, you can see 2017 and 2019 were, were, were pretty big. Uh, this year, we're kind of probably middle of the road. Steve, I don't know if you can project anything. We're operating now, um, but I don't know if you have any other thoughts on how many more days we'll have to operate. But I think if, if the weather cools down, hopefully uh, the requirement for the input of aeration will, will, uh, will you know, slide off. I think we'll probably run for a couple more weeks based on the heat the heat we have coming next week. Yeah. So 
That is, all, so you can see there the diffuser uh, down in the bottom. That's kind of where it's, 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 a, it's almost like a perforated pipe that's on the bottom of the, the channel down there up along our dock. And that's where the, the dissolved oxygen is being um, released. Um, you can't see anything really from the, the top of the water. Um, but we have in other demonstrations that we've done where we've just put soaker hose kind of in these racks and put them over the edge to see the efficiency uh, and do a lot of uh, data analysis. Um, just, we saw fish come into this thing. They were all over the place. They really uh, seemed to appreciate it. It was almost like an oxygen bar for the little fish. And then you'd see some of the bigger uh, predatory fish come along after a while. So thankfully we don't have that concentration right, uh, right at where we're delivering this uh, aerated water, but um, just anecdotally it is, it has been um, exciting for for the fish. The efficiencies of this thing are are such though that the the oxygen is so well entrained that it, you don't really see any upwelling, so you're not like wasting oxygen. It it, it kind of stays where it's supposed to be. Yeah. And I think that's the last slide. Is that right? Yes. Any other questions? Was that, uh, yes, go ahead, Mary. Oh, you're on mute. I, I was just wondering, um, just looking at number of days over 90 degrees, you know, this, this summer season here has been uh, probably twice as much as last summer season. And, um, I'm just wondering, you know, why it was only operated for 19 days. I mean, we had not, we had 19 days over, you know, over a hundred, you know, I mean, we had some, you know, like super hot days. And then just to check, there was one slide, you know, with a big whole presentation of one data set, you know, and then there was one down there, like, 3.7 or so and i'm just wondering what were, what was the time period for that data you want to go back to that real quick julia yeah one second um i sometimes believe it was you, august of 2024 but let me confirm sometimes you will see like an anomaly um and that's something that that we have to kind of truth throughout the overall let's see is well, this yeah, the slide? Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. It looks like it's got it, you know, it's it's pretty low down there for a little ways, mm -hmm. you know, for a few few bits. And so I'm just wondering, you know, if the goal was uh 5.2 to 6, you know, um how how many days did you were you under that? You know, where maybe, you know, maybe it ought have been turned on. Yo, we definitely were running it. Steve, I don't know if you have any uh, information about this specific uh, slide or time period, but but this wasn't a period. This was a period that we were we were operational. Yeah, I would say that may have been close to the beginning of the time when we first started operating. I know we started operating in July. I don't off the top of my head. I don't have the exact date that we started, but it probably would have been around that time. Yeah, and any time that we're, if we see consistent uh, numbers that are approaching the, and we can see the trend that is trending below, we turn it on. So this would be a time when we would be operating it until we got it back up. And probably when we hit that 8.4 is probably uh, when we turned it off or probably maybe before that. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just I'm just wondering, you know, to um, you know, like it would be nice to see temperature, you know, air temperature data, you know, along with the with the DO and you know the full time series, you know, because it got hot, you know, it was hot in June, you yeah. know, and and if you you decide, you know, like that you know, it, it, your season starts in July, you know, that's something that, 
you know, maybe ought be reconsidered, you know, given that climate change is now? Oh, we don't, we don't, there's no, there's not a range as far as time. We, we look at this uh, throughout the entire year. We operate this. Uh, yeah. There's, there's not a, an off season. So it, um, it looks like that we started running this year on July 19th uh, based on what I'm seeing here. And a lot of what you, the reason why it may have started then as opposed to June, uh, which you kind of asked about is, you're still getting uh, like melt, snow melt, and that kind of helps elevate ox uh, DO levels uh, throughout that part of the year. Yeah, there were probably still still higher flows that that were uh, helping uh, to to keep the dissolved oxygen levels up. There's 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 a few different factors, and uh, and I think we go into it a little bit more in some of our of our reports, but. Um, and we'd be happy to send send those out if. Well, you said where they can be found. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or or thoughts on on this? I know it was a little bit of a detour from what we usually are focused on, but. Jason, any thoughts uh, from from your end on on our observations of our the aeration project? Well, yeah, I just want to you know make sure everyone understands that you know it's it's operational once once that I believe this is correct. It's operational once the DO hits that level. It's not time specific. Like we don't start it in June every year. It's just when the DO reaches a certain critical level, um, then that's when it goes on. It's it's not that okay. Well, it's June first. We better turn it on now. Mm -hmm. um, so. It operates when the DO hits a certain level. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're almost out of time. One other thing I wanted to say was that uh, in our in our survey, Hector uh, provided some good feedback and talking about uh, different topics for for these meetings. And so we'll start sending out um, some information a couple of weeks uh, prior to the the POCs uh, to see if we can get feedback from if there's anything that folks are interested in and in, in talking about and uh, or topics they'd like the port to present on, or if there's other folks that could come present as well. So we uh, will be sending that out so people can have input on, on uh, the agenda. Okay. Margo, sorry, I missed you earlier do, oh. during roll call. Happy to have you here. <laughs> oh, happy to be here. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. We appreciate it. And um, we'll be in touch. And, and if we don't hear from you, we will see you next month. Thank you. Thanks. Thank all. you. Thanks.